Levi Collins. Levi Collins. Yeah, he has a viral, something wrong with his thyroid. They've already okay. done surgery several times and never gotten the right one. Now, does Levi go to the church there? Where yes. He goes? Okay. Thank you. I tell you what, you can put those and set those right on the on the communion table there, would you? And uh, so, if you would add Levi Collins to your list, please, to this list. This just came in. That just came in. So, uh, and then I added Brother Charlie Jones. I spoke to him this morning. Tried to see him Monday. I was over in that area and stuff, and he was gone. But he has congestive heart failure and kidney failure actually kidney failure and uh, his diuretics um the diuretics are what did i say to, what did i tell you about him june something about they're making him they make him sick too so oh yeah that's right the, the diuretic medications they give him are making his throat swell up he's got to have his throat stretched so Charlie's already in his 80s, you know, so uh, pray for him. That's right down in the middle on in the column on the first page. And I'm sorry, I just was typing fast and I didn't get the S on, so I wrote it in. Jones, Pastor Charles, okay, congestive heart failure and kidney failure. And he's got to have, an, it was hard for him even to talk on the phone today, but uh, pray for him. And then I put our scriptures on the very back at the uh, lower right-hand corner. If you don't know what to pray, refer to these. These are the, we haven't gotten to Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 17 yet, but these are all, the pa these are passages where you have the prayers of the Apostle Paul. So, Remember that if you, have, if you run out of things to pray or don't know what to pray for people, uh, go read those passages and ask the Lord to do those things for others. And I would appreciate it if you pray for me. All right? So uh, pray. Uh, evangelists and pastors are on the second page. Missionaries are on the second page. And the, again, the letter S indicates that we support them okay, so if you see an ass next to missionary family name we support them okay all right so our church folks these are the ones we consider ours sue, uh, sue collier edna harold the Hare family uh, the mueller family the meyer family the patnaud family smith uh, christy smith Sister Debbie Sutton, Wayne Temple, and Leonard Zeig. And some of these, our folks are mentioned in other areas on the sheet with regard to their health. Um, but there's probably no one on, in that <laughs> list of church families that doesn't need some prayer for their health. So if you just ask the Lord to be with the health of all of the folks that have come here, we don't have any people that are jumping hurdles, running long races, all right, uh, and uh, not having some effect. So all of us need prayers for our health, all right? And then, of course, salvation, folks that need salvation, including George Harold, Steve Sutton. And uh, then um, I think, uh, oh, I see it got separated. Reiner, Richard Reiner, got divided up there on the right column on the first page where it says Reiner and just to, it got separated the name got broken up but that's uh, someone David's working with along with Smurf the cement truck driver and others there just uh, and then the hair hair family members and and all of these all right remember our town remember evangelism in our town remember souls and families, which we put in big bright letters on the back. What else did I put? Brother 
uh, this time, I don't remember if we have it on the last sheet now, but Brother Matthew Barnes, you see that in the third column on the second page, Brother Matthew Barnes and his legislative prayer and council ministry in Indianapolis at the Capitol. And I'm sure he would appreciate our prayers, and this helps us when we're praying for those that are in authority. All right, he has a special ministry to them. So remember our remember all of our legislators, Congress people, sheriffs, our county sheriffs, and the president, vice president, Congress people, everyone, okay? Uh, the mayor here in Salem is Mr. Green. What's his first name? I forgot his first name. All of a sudden. Yeah, when I asked it, everybody forgot it. But anyway, Mr. Green, remember him? All right. Uh, sister, I didn't get it on here, but Sister uh, Thurman, that is senior, uh, Brother Thurman's mother. Did we get it on here? Yeah. Oh, we got it on here. Okay, so remember her? She's... Uh, supposed to come home from the hospital. They just had a wedding. Her and uh, Brother Thurman's dad just had their 76th wedding anniversary. 76th wedding, wedding anniversary. How about that? They're on the front under health. So, uh, In the front under health. So she, she's she been hospitalized and she uh, is probably coming home tomorrow. So continue to pray for her. Okay, I see it now. Try right, Joseph and Naomi Thurman. All right, any others? We don't want to belabor too much, just to make you aware. And you can take the sheet and pray at home. And this helps us, as remember, all of our folks, helps us not to spend so much time just reading uh, a prayer list. If everybody can have it, pay attention to it, okay? Bereaved. The Elliott Meyer families and the McDowell family. Also, the Pike family, Brother Randy Pike, uh, <coughs> went home to be with the Lord this last week. So remember the Pike family, if you would. Dad? Yes. Oh, yes, Bert Houston passed away. Did we get Bert on here? No, we did not. Uh, Bert Houston, that's. Uh, Lenny Houston's brother, and I didn't know it until just weeks ago that that's Brian Houston's dad. I had no idea. And uh, so just a few weeks ago, I heard that he was part of the, that same Houston family. And that funeral is at 1 o'clock tomorrow at uh, uh, DeWalt. DeWalt. Right, so. Hi. Right. And we might try to go over there because uh, Brother brother uh, Lenny and Sister Sandy probably be over there. And uh, others. All right. Okay. David will lead us in some singing. And then we will, if you watch the doors or listen for the doors, you never know if Brother Ron may come in in the middle. All right. Take your church hymnal there, page 350. We'll stand again, 350 on the bottom. Sweet by and by. Yes. On that first day of the Lord. Yeah. 
chapter 9 will be our congregation reading Revelation 9. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, all together. And, and the, the fifth, fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, 
but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they, and they had, had tails like unto scorpions, scorpions, and there they were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his, hath his name Apollyon. And one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of Jason, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, Neither, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their, their fornication, nor, nor of their thefts. They may be seated. All right. All right. Amen. Well, while we're there, while you got, if you've still got that chapter open, just a little bit of review, and remember that these. Uh, uh, these beasts they come out of the bottomless pit and we're not expected to understand how they live now in the bottomless pit or if they are created if God creates these as something new during the uh, tribulation period or what that case specifically is but there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth verse 3 and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power we have no reason nor warrant to accept that in any way but literally and so they come out uh, and they're they are not there to hurt the grass or the trees, uh, but they're going to hurt the environmentalists. Amen. <laughs> Instead of the grass and the trees, they're going to hurt the people that uh, try to protect the grass and the trees. All right. And uh, notice the down below, and I say this quite deliberately, but it's an important place in the Bible to go along to put in as a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 where it talks about hair. Do you know that most Christian people that you talk to today or I should, I'm, I'm saying Christian with quite a bit of um, tolerance, aren't I? 
uh, what I mean is professing Christians, people who say that they are Christians, they, they absolutely uh, believe, and there are some, many that absolutely believe, and, and it's hard to find any that don't, that hair doesn't matter at all to God that the subject of hair doesn't matter to God. And it does. And it does. And God defines here in verse number eight, they had hair as the hair of women. So how would you, if, how would you uh, know what the hair of women is to be able to interpret your Bible? It, it has to have meaning, doesn't it? It has to have meaning. Yes. For one thing, God tells you that there is such a thing as women in the verse. Amen. That's right. So God says it, that their hair is as the hair of women. So uh, is it was it Matt Walsh who was traveling around the world? Was it Matt Walsh traveling around the world asking people what is a woman? And uh, so I don't know if he is familiar with this verse. I know that Matt is a Catholic. He's a Roman Catholic. Uh, but he's, nevertheless, he's a very intelligent man. And he's, uh, he's right in this thing as, as far as there being a definite, uh, exacting uh, definition and explanation of what is a woman. Amen. And it's foolish to even think otherwise. And I don't even know what, we don't even have to get into much discussion about it. Those of us that have half a brain. That might be all I have, but I know what a woman is. All right? Amen. And uh, because, uh, be, just because you live in this earth, the people who live in this earth, they ain't had uh, one day at school and know what a woman, the difference between a man and a woman. They know what a man is and know what a woman, woman is. Am I telling the truth? You go to the islands of the sea and the jungles of South China and North uh, Indochina, people that have never been in school a day, and if if you told them that there no that, that uh, you didn't know what a woman was, they would be absolutely certain that they were more educated than you are. And if you had a PhD, and they are, if you're if you've got a PhD, and say, well, I don't know how to define a woman like that. Why would any why should not any of us as Americans be angry when they're talking about putting somebody like that on the United States Supreme Court? All right. So anyway, God, God knows what a woman is. He created male and female. He created, uh, created man, male and female created he, him. And, uh, he says then that there, this, uh, these beasts have, these, uh, locusts have hair as the hair of a woman or hair of women, hair as the hair of women. So not only is there women, but there, but uh, the Bible tells you that there is hair that identifies a woman. We didn't write it, but we sure do believe it, and we're going to preach it, and that's not even being unkind or nasty. You know, the world has gotten so nasty that to talk about it, they think you're being nasty. But they've gotten so nasty. That they, the world has gotten so mean that if you talk about their meanness, they call you mean. But the world has gotten mean. The world has gotten vulgar beyond anything that we've seen even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And uh, so uh, that's the way, that's where we are today, waiting for the Lord's coming. And notice that if you go all the way down these these uh, creatures out of the bottomless pit, they are going after some people that are described in the chapter. Verse 20, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils so they, they did not repent. So what are they doing? They're worshiping devils. They worship idols of gold and of silver and of brass and stone and of wood 
uh, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So you see, there's total reprobation of mind. They, we're not, I don't believe that this is all talking about people that are out in jungles either. I believe that these are people that are in college uh, doctoral programs and have graduated from universities and so forth. And they didn't repent and they are worshiping devils. So that means that even in Salem, Indiana, I kid you not, there are people that worship devils and we all know it and any honest person knows it and there are people that know it but won't talk about it unless they're in very, very particular company where they think that they won't be uh, um, set at naught because of their comments. But there are people here, in even in this county, that worship devils. And as far as the gold, if they're not, if they don't have actual idols that you can see made of gold, but some of them actually do, uh, some of them actually do, especially some religious people, have actual idols made of gold and silver and brass, stone, wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Because we do know that because Roman Catholicism is full of such idols. Neither repented they of their murders. They didn't repent of their murders. And we have imagine imagine people murdering each other in a little thirty one thousand person county like Washington County. But there we have murders here. We just had a couple murders tried. In, uh, in in the courts, in, uh, in trial, right here in this county in the last month or two. So the people, even in rural areas of America, people kill each other. You'd think people would be able to stay apart long enough to get along in a small rural county, but they don't. They still kill each other. And then they didn't repent of their sorceries. Now, I will tell you this, and I'm you know I'm not the Greek scholar and I don't even care to be but I do know that sorceries in the Bible in this this word sorceries here also carries with it an indication of, of uh, drugs chemicals uh, substance abuse and everything like that you know uh, people that are uh, we've talked about before people being high on that old drug that's hardly ever mentioned anymore called LSD. You hardly ever hear it's still around but you hardly ever, ever hear anybody mention anymore but uh, and I've told you in the past about about when I was uh, young and saw a film was taken to see a film the doctors put together uh, showing people you know trying to uh, depict people that are on uh, LSD hallucinatory trips and uh, the fright that it brought to me as a as a young boy and uh, I, be I believe in being scared like that. I believe that. I, I believe if, if, if you can scare somebody, Jay, you can't live in fear. Well, I believe if you can scare a young person out of taking drugs, uh, you ought to scare them. Amen. If you can show them what it really does to them and how people are very, very uh, adversely affected by it, well, uh, they're sorceries. And that includes uh, alcohol and drug addiction and the whole thing. Nor of their fornication, we know what that means, impurity, sexual Im uh, impurity, and young people growing up in that and practicing that, nor of their thefts. So, and people are on drugs and all. I mean, it's we, it's it's big deal in our day, I and mean, that's where we are in our day. And this is where we are, and that we're headed to the Lord's coming, and uh, so forth. So that's where we are. All right, we need to have a word of prayer. You have your list. I won't try to pray down the list because it would take a considerable amount of time. But you have the list. We want you to have and take them, and do pray. Do pray for others. Pin them to your wall. Mag magnet them to your refrigerator or whatever. However you do it. Uh, or fold it up, put it in your billfold. And I made extra copies if you need extra copies, and I hope that you'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for the time you've given to us. 
I think tonight, Father, the first thing that you brought to my heart tonight was the bereaved. And I, I do think, Father, of uh, uh, Sister Pike, and I think of uh, the family. And Lord, we don't know the family, and I've never met Sister Pike, but I've heard so much about her, heard her voice. I remember hearing her voice in the background when I've spoken to Brother Pike on the phone. And I know that even in her elder years, she did so much to help her husband. And I remember that day, her running up and down the stairs from the basement back up to uh, to get things for him so that he could tell me about them and so forth and so on. I thought about that, dear sister. And now, now Brother Pike is in heaven. I pray that you touch her, bless her, give her comfort and uh, use her life, Father, in the remaining days, weeks, months, or years that you have for her. And I also ask, Lord, that you'd be with the McDow and the, all of the families around the McDowells. And uh, uh, Lord, we don't, we don't know that extended family either. Ne nevertheless, we ask that you would uh, touch them. And because we are grateful, Father, for Brother George and Sister Donna's life and the, even the influence and the effect uh, it had upon us and the kindness and how much of a help they were to us in our walk with the Lord. And we pray, Father, for the Elliot and the Meyer family tonight, families tonight and ask that you comfort them also in their loss. And I ask, Lord, that you would uh, uh, use these times uh, in their life, Father, to, to strengthen them, edify them, grow them up in the Lord and help them, Lord. And I do pray tonight for Brother Barry, and I ask, Lord, that you'd strengthen his body. We thank you, Father, that he's home, and we ask, Lord, that you'd continue to strengthen him. We pray, Lord, that the medications would be right. Now, Father, it just seems like it's with he and with Eric. Uh, it, it's, it's just a continuous thing, and we're not doctors. We know nothing about what they have, really, just what we're told. And we ask, Father, uh, knowing that it is serious that you just touch them, relieve them, Father, of some of this. It's so good when we can see them walk in the door, when they're well enough, Father, to travel up and come in. Now we ask for our Father that you'd help them. Lord, I pray for Sister Sue and her health, her eyes, her heart. I pray, Father, for Sister Debbie and her blood conditions and other things that she has. I pray, Father, for uh, Brother Leonard, ask that you'd help him, Father, in the physical maladies that he has. And I ask for his wife, Mary, <clears throat> Lord, that you'd speak to her heart in these last hours and days of her life, Father, if she can understand anything in her spirit, that you'd deal kindly with her, Father. I do pray, Father, for uh, Sister Edna, and I pray, Lord, I know that she has cancer, and I pray that you'd touch her. We also pray, Father, that you'd save George, and we pray that you'd save Steve uh, Sutton as well. I pray, Father, also for the Mueller family, you continue to provide for them, give David the work that he needs, and at the right time that he needs it, and the right place. And Father, don't let other concerns waste his resources or his time. Uh, let him have the full uh, benefit, Father, of his labor. I pray, Father, for Adam the same way. And I pray, Lord, that you would give him labor that could produce more income for his family, if that be thy will. But one way or another, Lord, we pray that you keep him safe as he travels back and forth to work and give him enough work to take care of his home. We pray, Father, for these younger families that, that need this, need your hand upon their lives. We pray for Sister Lara's parents, Lord, that you touch them. We pray for their health. You know exactly what they need. We pray you, you touch them. I do pray for Brother Ron, and I ask, Lord, that you would touch him and give him strength in these years. And, uh, Father, we ask that you would just help him in his uh, oft infirmities as well. And we pray, Father, for Brother Wayne and ask that you would touch him, Lord. We, we have... Uh, Father, to be quite honest, uh, we have little uh, confidence in the care that he gets. And I pray, Father, that he would get better care and that people would take more time, Father, to 
to not just let him fade away and get worse, but Father, truly to help him. Lord, please do that for him. And Lord, we all need your help in these days. We need your help in our, in our physical lives. But Lord, most of all, we need to draw closer unto you. This day, Father, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our dear great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need more of you. We need you to touch, Father, our existence. Use us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And uh, we pray that you'd give us direction for days to come. Well, thank you for how Christ is magnified and given the preeminence in our work. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. All right. Well, uh, look out the, at the, you know, just take a peek out the door and see if there's uh, any sign of Brother Ron. I don't want him to get stuck out there. And um, not yet. Okay. So if you kind of get up and check once in a while, make sure it's not stuck. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14. And we've been through the Gospels, we've been through dear, uh, fear, the subject of fearing God and giving Him the glory. Uh, and we uh, looked at the fact that Revelation chapters 12 and through 14 are another view of the entire tribulation period. The future Babylon is described in more detail uh, in Revelation 18, right after the nature of that Babylon is described in Revelation 17. Or may I say that there's always possibility of a double influence and so forth. You know, uh, for years and years, people have tried to say, well, that's, that's the Roman Catholic Church and that's Rome. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were just talking before the service of the ecumenic, uh, ecumenicism or ecumenicalism, how, however you want to say that. There is, uh, there is uh, the, the great ecumenical one world church, and that is involving also, I believe, and I, we've said it many times, that it involves Mohammedanism. So let's not forget that. Uh, Mohammedanism, you know, in our lifetime has been on the rise and it, it follows a lot of the patterns of communism in that it, it works, it, it takes leaps forward and then it kind of hides for a while. It takes leaps forward and then it steps back into the shadows for a while. And you don't see much on the news at the moment about it. But uh, I, I know that uh, across our borders, they are still coming in. They still intend the destruction of, of all things that are not what they believe. But at the same time, they'll ride any horse that they can ride until they get their way. You understand what I'm saying? And so they'll, they'll jump on the horse with the ecumenical uh, so-called Christians They'll get on the horse with them. That's what they've done with this outfit called Chrislam, uh, which is a which is a Rick Warren uh, kind of thing. And uh, uh, I haven't I, I haven't checked this out, and I'm stepping out on a limb here because we are live on Facebook. But some preachers told me that. Uh, uh, that they that they now that uh, Saddleback Church, whatever it is, his name of his church, Saddleback Church out in California, that now they do allow uh, homosexuals to sing in the choir there at that church. Well, that doesn't surprise me. You know how much of a surprise that is to me. Yeah, that surprised me about as much as if you were to tell me that the sun comes up in the morning. All right. Because that's what I, that's exactly what I expect. And I, where, how do I expect that? I expect that from the verses that we just read, uh, in the ninth chapter. In the very last verses of the ninth chapter. Where men don't repent. And when they don't repent, they get worse. Don't they? They don't repent, they get worse. And, and folks, there is reprobation of the mind. There is, in fact, reprobation of the of man's mind. 
however you however you uh, uh, want to pretend or anybody wants to pretend that men uh, will always be able to come back to God some way but the reprobation of mind means if so, if a man is truly reprobate uh, it would really have to be something of God because uh, the reprobation means they no longer can even think right about life or eternity. They can no longer even function in their mind properly about those issues. And so when, when men are of reprobate mind, the only thing that is spoken of in, of them in the Bible is destruction. And they're, they're like those that are described where they, they uh, uh, in Second Thessalonians chapter number two, they've just believed a lie and they're just reprobate with regard to the truth and they're just not going to come. And they're, they're, they're under judgment. And uh, so I know that we, we, don't, we don't go around looking for people, and I think this is important, we don't go around looking for people that we believe have crossed the line and, and declare whether they have re, uh, become reprobate in their mind. We are still going to give the gospel as though any man can be saved, and we're not going to try to uh, we're not going to try to determine. But we know that there are men like that because the Bible, the Book of Revelation, uh, absolutely describes it. The, the Second Thessalonians describes it, and Second Thessalonians chapter two, they are deluded. Men become deluded, and they can no longer think right. There are men that do become deluded and you can sit and preach to them hour after hour, day after day for 10 years and they're not going to they're not going to budge from their wickedness. You know that's the truth. We know that's the truth in the Bible. We don't like it, but we have to declare it as being the truth. We have to acknowledge that. And yet, if someone, you know, anybody that comes and wants to talk to me about the Lord Jesus, I may not know where their mind is, but I'm going to tell them the truth anyway. I'm just I'm going to stand for the truth, and I'm going to tell them the truth. They might already be of a reprobate mind, but I've done my job. I've done all I can do to give the truth. Amen. All right. So only God really knows all that. But uh, do remember, in uh, do remember that there are men of reprobate mind. Look in uh, what I do in my testimony. Here, I guess I didn't bring it. Oh, here it is, right in front of me. See, I got new glasses, so I can't see nothing. All right. Revelation chapter number 16. There's Brother Ron. And I saw the lights out there. It's nice to see the lights of Brother uh, Ron's car come in, but it's not as pretty as the lights of glory that we're waiting for. Amen. The lights of, <laughs> amen, the lights of heaven. All right, so, but anyway, good to see him. Uh, Revelation chapter number 16, Revelation chapter number 16, I'm going to read verses 17 through 19. Revelation 16, verses 17 through 19. And the seventh seal, now this is, this is on past where we are studying, but we need this for reference. And the seventh angel uh, poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Now I believe that's the same teleos. I believe that's the same kind of word as when the Lord said on the cross, it is finished. It's the same idea. It is done. In other words, there's no redoing it. You can't start over. You can't fix this thing. It is done. Amen. Now here, of course, it's talking about something uh, that that's not not uh, going to be particularly appreciated. Pouring out uh, the pouring out of uh, of the uh, of a vial into the air. There came a great voice. Came. It's it's judgments, right? And so he said, "It's done. It's over." It's like saying, "What I have spoken, I've spoken." It's like saying, uh, uh, "Take that." You know, boom, take that. You can't get out of it. You can't go back and do it over. It is done. That's the sense of that expression there. 
And, and I'm glad when the Lord said it was finished concerning the positive thing of salvation, aren't you glad it is finished? <laughs> Amen. Aren't you glad you don't have to redo that? Don't want to redo that. If you tried to redo that, it couldn't work. I'm glad what the Lord did is finished. Aren't you? As far as our redemption on Calvary's cross. Thank God. Thank God for that. Amen. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. Not much more frightening on the earth, a frightening thing on the earth than an earthquake. Not much more frightening than that. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake. Uh, I've just been in some small tremors in California where I grew up because we did, we lived kind of on the San Andreas fault, but it's their fault. <laughs> It's all their fault, amen. Not my fault. It's all their fault. <laughs> all right. So, but that's how that we lived. So we felt tremors, but I never did feel a very strong one. I never lived in a house that got damaged by one. Uh, but uh, in nineteen, I believe it was nineteen eighty nine, wasn't it? Just before we went, it was nineteen eighty nine where the where freeways fell and parts of bridges across the San Francisco Bay fell and. Uh, damage in the Bay Area Rapid Transit Tunnel, that big earthquake quake down, down there at that time. And uh, you could see, at that time, you could see things uh, on the news about the terror that it put into people. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible, it's a horrible feeling, you know. Just the earth shaking underneath you. It's a horrible thing. And of course, it's common in the Philippines. It's, it's common, uh, it's common in what they, uh, an area they call the Ring of Fire. Or you know what the Ring of Fire is? That's the, that's the volcano belt around the Pacific, around the Pacific Rim. You know, there's a belt of volcanoes, and uh, with volcanoes is always earthquakes, right? They're related, and so it's a fright. It's a terrorizing feeling. Uh, I think a volcano would scare me if I, you know, in my mortal nature, it would, it would frighten me more than an earthquake. Being around a tornado. Uh, uh, her, uh, volcano, right? And that one, uh, we weren't there either when that happened, but uh, that one that was in northern Luzon that put ash, covered everything in ash, but we got there after that too. So we're always late or early, you know. Uh, we never get there when the exciting things happen. <laughs> I thank the Lord for that. Amen. All right, but uh, but you know, there were still effects. We, we drove up uh, we drove up to Clark Air Base. I think you know, we all went up there with the folks from the church to Clark Air Base area uh, and saw there, there were still areas covered with ash. There were still little uh, places, you know, where they could hold water or whatever, you know, little basins and, and people's yards that were unkept. It's still ash from that same uh, volcano and everything. And people talked about the terror that it brings, the fear that it brings. So here's earthquakes, earthquakes. Um, uh, the uh, earthquake, great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So if you think about all of the earthquakes that men have experienced, this earthquake's going to be the greatest of them all. The greatest that man has ever experienced will take place during Daniel's 70th week. It says, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so this is uh, this is before you even get to the discussion of the nature of Mystery Babylon. This is back in the 16th chapter, and you get to its description in Revelation 17, and then mention uh, and then the mention of its fall came before that, even before that, and then of course the very nature of its sinfulness, its wickedness, and its connection with the with the devil you find in Revelation 17 and 18 particularly. So we've seen up to this point three full accounts of the tribulation. We mentioned this last week. 
that we've seen the seven seals open, the seven trumpets, the seven, uh, I'm sorry, not the seven, but the descriptions of the work of the Antichrist. And in the next chapter, in chapter number 15, uh, we will see another view. And it's the pouring out. We just read part of it there because it goes 15 and 16. The pouring out of the seven vials with the seven last plagues. And we want it, we said last week, getting towards the end, that uh, these things, these things are uh, parallel, uh, they, they are con con not consecutive, not happening one after another, but they're happening parallel. These accounts are parallel. So these are three accounts of the very same thing. All right. And then the last week we ended with dealing with the subject of hell, Luke chapter number 16, and we talked about the condition of the soul in hell. Uh, so in verse number 12 of Revelation 14, I'm trying to get used to new glasses. I'm trying to see if I can keep them on because uh, they changed the configuration of the bifocal. And so I'm trying to see if uh, bifocal helps my vocal or my vocal helps the focal, or so we'll see what happens here. Revelation chapter 14 and uh, verse number 12. Verse number 12 in Revelation 14. Revelation 12, verse number 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one like unto the Son of Man. Why was he, why was he like unto the Son of Man? Because he was the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. All right, I'm in Revelation chapter 14 and verse number uh, 14. I'm sorry, verse 12. Let me go back to verse 12. Okay, here is the patience of the saints. Here, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For you, if you have the faith of Jesus, what ought you to do? Keep the commandments of God. Amen. All right. So they, they did both. They do both. These are described here, do both. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, ye say it the Spirit. Yea, say it the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor. I'm going to preach a message one of these days on the, on the expression, Yea, say it the Spirit. Amen. I like that little expression. Yea, say that. That confirms things to the heart and to the mind. Yea, say it the Spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. Now, their works do follow them, and then, and then I, my mind jumped ahead and my eyeballs did too, to verse 14, because you have upon the cloud uh, one that sat, one sat like unto the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying. Now, from verse number 13, though, to verse number 14, you see there that it talks about, it talks about their labors, uh, their works to follow them. The rest of their, it says that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, how practical is that to you tonight, that your works follow you? You know, your works follow you too. You know, your works follow you. Now, now the people don't people don't take that into account when they get busy saying that they're a Christian. They get busy talking about loving the Lord. They get busy even doing some things around the church. But their works follow them. Therefore, whatever you're going to do for the Lord, make it right and make it serious. Make it serious. I, I put something today. I hadn't ever thought about it in these words before, but I did today. And I put out I put out this. If you have right motives, but wrong methods, if you have good motives, but wrong methods, it will lead to wrong motives because then you'll have to keep defending and perpetuating your methods. You understand what I'm saying? If your motives are right, even if your motives are right, but your methods are wrong, eventually it will lead to wrong motivations. And that wrong motivation will be, well, I started this method. Now I got to defend it. Now I got to, how do I perpetuate this method? 
Best thing is to give up the method. But, but all, often men say, is they just keep perpetuating the method. You know, this method is right and this method works. Even in missions, I, I go to missions conferences, I hear people talk about methods and about things that always work. You know, when I was on the mission field, sometimes some of those things didn't always work. <laughs> you know, but other things did. Other things did. So I always, I always tried to say, well, better have the motive right and let God worry about it, get, let God teach us a method for doing this here, doing this here. I know a, a man who I talked about him. Who did we talk to about uh, uh, Dwight Tomlinson? I shouldn't say his name maybe on that. Who were we were talking about? Dwight. Oh, it was uh, with Brother uh, Vance Willett. Brother Vance Willett over in LaGrange, Kentucky. Good man, good brother. Brother Lance, pretty sure do appreciate him. He's got such a kind spirit, patient spirit. And um, Brother Brother Vance knows some people that we know from years ago on the mission field. And there was one missionary that uh, was a good man. There no uh, no uh, questioning his his um, discretion or anything of that nature. But when he was building churches in the States, he pastored, actually started a couple of churches in the States. And he did it using bus ministry, you know. He said, I'm going to have a bus ministry. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no, I have no problem with a bus ministry. I have no problem with that at all. If uh, I have a problem about going into big debt over it, but I, you know, I know one church about went over and had everything it owned confiscated in Jacksonville because it thought it thought we're going to have a big bus ministry and grow this church and grow this church. And about 10 years later, they've just about had everything repossessed because the bus, they couldn't pay the bill on the buses. And so, you know, those things have to be, you have to be careful about those. Kind of things. But this man, nothing wrong and nothing wrong with using buses to bring people to Sunday school, to church. Nothing wrong at all. Nothing wrong with using vans and people's cars and bring people to church. And nothing wrong with that at all. But this man thought that he, he decided he was going to go to Hong Kong and he was going to be a missionary in Hong Kong. So when they got to Hong Kong, the missionaries asked, that were already there that knew him, missionaries that were kind of of his same background, said that, Said, uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to how are you going to build a work? He said, I'm going to do just what I do in the states. I'm going to build, but I'm going to I'm going to have a bus ministry, and I'm going to build it with a bus ministry. All right. Um, what's his motive? Was his motive good? Yeah, bring people to to church. Sure, his motive was good, but what he didn't think about, and of course he was there for a little while, and it kind of did get it. it he got it <laughs> after a while. How does almost everybody travel in Hong Kong every day? By bus. <laughs> they go everywhere by bus. You know, if they most most Hong Kong most Hong Kong people don't own automobiles. They either take they take a, a full size bus as big as a Greyhound, or they they take a twenty four passenger bus or a sixteen passenger what they call light buses. Twenty four and sixteen pass they call them light buses. And that's how people travel all over Hong Kong. Uh, or you can take a taxi. But, you know, you travel into the same point every day. Taxis get expensive. You might as well learn where the bus goes by there. And almost everywhere in Hong Kong, at one point in time or another, a bus goes by there. It's hard to find a place in Hong Kong where a bus doesn't go by in the morning and in the afternoon. And usually many times. So, he, so people are kind of... They, they ride the bus every day. Guess what they didn't want to do on Sunday? They didn't want to ride a bus. <laughs> they ride a bus every day. All right? So what he's just started letting them do is actually not as far. He, did, he They thought, the Chinese people thought, for the church to have buses. It's almost, uh, to them it just seemed strange, you know? You know how most of his church, and he did get people to come to church. You know how most of them traveled to church? Same bus, on a bus, 
But it was the same city buses every day, like they took to work, like they went shopping, and it went right by the church. So they couldn't understand why he was spending money to buy buses when there was already buses that went right by the church. You know, in the in the Chinese mind, that didn't fit. Well, it didn't fit me. <laughs> didn't fit the other. But you know, nobody tried to discourage him. But he learned. He learned. All right. Now, I said, what I said was uh, motive. Sometimes, if we if if we have wrong motive, right motives, but wrong methods. It can turn to wrong motives too if we're trying to just perpetuate the method. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's have right motives and right methods. Let's have right motives and let's have right methods. Let's make sure the motives are correct first. Why are we doing something? Why are we doing it? Are we doing things for the right reasons? And as, that'll be discussed quite a bit, of course, in our mission school. In May, motivation. What's what is the biblical motivations for the things that we do? And are American methods always transferable everywhere around the world? Actually, they are. Le they are fewer times than not of applicable in foreign countries. All right. So we will discuss that. But the the. Uh, in verse number 12, 14, I looked and behold a white cloud upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man. So our works go before us. Our, our, uh, our motives go before us. Our motives go before us. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll give you these and then we'll stop. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses number 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay. Remember their works went before, right? For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So our, our, motive, our motive is to stand on that one foundation that God's already laid, and that's Jesus Christ, and work for his preeminence. Verse number 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So the two different, two different, uh, two different sets. There's gold, silver, and precious stones, and there's wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. How's that? Well, our works go before us. What we do for the Lord's already on account. Not for salvation, for reward. Our work goes before us. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, I believe this is in heaven. This is in heaven. This is, this is not on earth. God's going to reveal at the very at the very same time that our works are being revealed by fire, God's going to be judging by fire and sword. Remember we said that last week? By fire and sword on this earth. And our works, our works, not our salvation, but our works, those things that we try to build upon the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. They're going to be tried by fire. What's going to be affected by the fire? The gold, silver, precious. Everything's going to be affected one way or another, but what's going to be affected adversely? The wood, hay, stubble. Amen. Our gold will be purified. Dross will be taken out. All of that. Amen. But God's going to, God said he's going to use fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what? Of what sort it is. That's, that is our motivation. That's our motives. Why did we do it? What sort of work is it? Is it a Christ honoring motivation? Is it something that is biblical? Can we find something like it in the scripture that points to it? All right. Uh, and of course, I, I could go many directions with that, but I'm not going to tonight. I'm going to just, just go through this. Notice, 
Verse number 15, if any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss. Our works go before us. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So he's, he, there's no loss of salvation in here. But we're going to suffer loss. We're going to suffer some loss. Some things are going to be burned up. I have things that are going to be burned up. I have things that I thought were right that are going to be burned up. I have things that I wish I could go back and say, I would like to do that better. I'd like to do that right. I'd like to do that with less confusion. I'd like to do that with less flesh involved. So some things are going to be burned up. We're going to suffer loss. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's immediately upon telling us that we're going to suffer some loss. But there's going to be some things that remain. And we're going to, our souls are going to be saved, so yet is by fire. And then immediately know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Now that's what, that's what, uh, Christians forget. They forget that they're temples of God, or they never realize or it's never preached to them that they are the temple of God and that there's, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I don't, I, God doesn't want rock and roll music in his temple. God, does, God doesn't want. God doesn't want our endorsement of those kind of things in our from our temple. God wants what? What things concerning our temple? Holiness, see that? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is what? Holy. Which temple ye are? Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. I mean, to me, really wise, truly wise. Let him become a fool as far as this world. I see, I see a lot of, I see Christians and professing Christians endorsing a lot of things that aren't of God and a lot of entertaining things and so forth saying, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? Oh, so, oh, what's wrong with that? Well, just because God's sword and fire didn't fall on you immediately doesn't mean that it, it's holy. Payday doesn't always come on Friday where God's concerned. All right, let's look at it. Let's look at another verse. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 10. I got to, I got to click. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we all shall stand, say it with me, at the judgment, before the judgment seat of Christ. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See that? All of us. Every believer. Every believer. All right, let's look at another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. <laughs> For we must all appear, he said the same thing to the Roman church, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Who's he writing to? Believers or unbelievers? He's writing to believers. For we, verse 10, we includes it, himself in it. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't, I don't think most Christians take that seriously. I don't think most professing Christians believe that at all. That would have to change you. Wouldn't it have to change you to believe that? Wouldn't have, wouldn't it? 
But you, if you hadn't been believing, if somebody hadn't been believing it, and, and they come to believe it, it'd be like one of them earthquakes. It would rattle them, wouldn't it? Knowing, verse 11, therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'll tell you what, I, I'll tell you this, without getting very deep in this verse, I believe this. If a Christian finally ever comes around to the fact that he's going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or bad, just the contemplation of having to appear before the Lord Jesus and answer would cause a Christian to be a persuader of men. It would cause a Christian to have a desire to win people to Jesus Christ. And then having a desire to win people to Jesus Christ would have its effect in having other things in order, would it not? So for what purpose? For credibility, for believability. If you want to, if you give someone the gospel, do you want them to believe you or not believe you? So it changes, it would change your credibility. If you really believe, if a Christian really believed that they're going to have, it would change the way they thought about everything in their life. I believe that. I believe it would cause them to think about what they watch, what they listen to, what they wear, where they go. Because they would have to, they know they have to give an answer before the judgment seat of our Savior for things done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And there's a terror in that. There's a terror in that. And so... Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. In other words, Paul had credibility. They looked at Paul and they said, this is a man that's obeying God. This is a man that's bringing honor to Christ. This is a man who's God's apostle. This is, man, this is, this is a man we can believe. That doesn't mean that Paul didn't have some challenge to his authority. He did from time to time. Paul did have challenge to his authority and had to straighten that out. But for the most part, those that knew the Lord Jesus understood his authority and they understood his credibility. They understood his honesty with the word of God. And they understood that he didn't play around. And they understood that he didn't corrupt the word of God, which many were doing even in his day. So there's a credibility factor in all of these things. One, one more verse. One more verse. Lord, help me not just to preach. Just <laughs> to mind. Even to mind the Lord. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Colossians 3, verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. See that? Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Not just the inheritance, but the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Who do you serve? You serve the Lord Christ. There's, there's reward in serving. Not only is there a fire, not only is there burning up, but thank the Lord, there is a reward of the inheritance because you serve the Lord Christ. You serve. You serve. By the way, who, who can understand this book of Revelation? Who's the book written for? We said at the very beginning of the study. Do you remember? Who's the book of Revelation written for? Servants. Servants. You read Revelation chapter 1. The people, people say, I, just, I don't read the book of Revelation because I don't understand it. Well, maybe the problem is they have no service to the Lord. They don't make any attempts to serve the Lord. If, if people don't serve the Lord, God's not obligated to give them any light from that book because it was written to servants. Amen. That says that specifically in the first chapter. People wonder why they don't get it. They don't get it. You can get it. Amen. Serve the Lord. 
I really think there's a principle in all of the scriptures. The, I, I believe the more someone determines that they're going to be a servant of the Lord, I think the more of the Bible they begin to, begin to understand anyway, don't you? Because the Lord knows you need the wisdom of this book to serve others as well as him. The Lord knows that. So the Lord will feed you. This book will feed you. This book will give you the wisdom that you need. So there's the general principle in the Bible that when you devote yourself to some service, you'll find that the Spirit of God will give you understanding from the Bible that will help you in that service. See? So it's very specific in the book of Revelation that the book is written to service. So you can expect servants to understand the book of Revelation and others will say, I just can't get it. I have a real problem with it. Are we sure that's really supposed to be in the canon? Because it sure does have some strange things in it. People actually have said that. People have said that to me. Are we sure that this book and that book supposed to be in the canon? And you better watch it. God put you in a canon. <laughs> Better be careful, amen. All right. Okay, we better stop there. David, come lead the Senate song.